as I say, it's, I will say a few more things that I think they're relevant. And then uh, uh, I would like to open a conversation with you, OK? Uh, and don't be embarrassed or ashamed to ask questions, OK? So we can talk together. OK, so this, we saw this. And the idea uh, and is interesting here uh, uh, because these are, I wanted to say, recurring themes. So if you think at that time we were talking about the relation between certain type of risks and health and environment, no? This is a subject that is everyday discussion and conversation, okay? The idea about how scientific are models or simulation models or systems analysis is something that's discussed almost daily. And the same in relation about the, about the relation between science and democracy. Okay? Think about what's going on in many Western countries today. Okay, thank you. Okay, next time I'll send a clone. That's... Uh, 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 uh. Okay, okay, sorry about this. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so all these subjects about the nature of uh, the problems that are faced by decision makers or administrators at uh, technical agencies case of Ruckel's house, okay? When, and I will come back to that soon. Now, what I, I want you to understand is that uh, things have changed a lot. When we started to work on, on uncertainty, on risks, on the relation between science and politics, policy, and all the rest, there were things that you couldn't say. OK? And I'll show you this. Uh, this is from 1992. And that was the Rio Conference on the Environment. I don't know if someone remembers. The first United Nations Conference on the Environment. Well, I was there, you know. <laughs> so it's interesting. And the interesting thing is that when we talk today about sustainability goals, sustainable goals, uh, sustainable development, and all the rest, it all really comes from uh, 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 the discussions at that time in Rio. And there was something that was called a local agenda 21. Uh, the older people will remember. And among the principles of local, yeah, it was what was called uh, principle 15 that was later developed into the, it was called the precautionary principle. Have you heard of it? And the whole idea of the precautionary principle is impossible to understand unless you think about what I said before. Look at how to act legitimately in the face of uncertainty. Unless you are aware about this dual legitimacy situation or framework, it is impossible to understand this. Why do we need to legitimate action if we believe this damage that it is being done? Okay, is that? But look what is interesting. The word uncertainty is not there. It's all about unser scientific uncertainty, but the word uncertainty is not, is not mentioned. And so uh, the, you have to have 
lack of full scientific certainty. Is lack of full scientific certainty a synonym of scientific uncertainty? In a course of philosophy, in particular analytical philosophy, you know that Frege's and Russell distinction between sense and reference. These are not the same things. But uncertainty is not mentioned. And I would say <laughs> we couldn't mention uncertainty that is not reduced to risk as in terms of night together with science. And look at this. It says, when it says sci full scientific certainty, what it's giving you the idea is that this is trans a transitory state of the system that eventually with time and resources you'll arrive to certainty. So is the glass half full or half empty? What trans science and Weinberg said is not there are problems that cannot be solved. Scientific. Again, that needs a full course, but I won't go. But this is how it shows, and we are in 92. Now, what's interesting is that uh, how it changes. This is from 2005, so we are almost 15 years into that. And this is a book by uh, an epidemiologist, eh? David Michaels who is publishing a book uh, next year about the same. And he talks about the fabrication of uncertainty. So not only that now we mention uncertainty, but we also said that uncertainty can be created and used strategically. In other words, can be used politically. Now, here again is an ambiguous statement because we can argue that science and technology create uncertainty positively. So science and technology in its progress creates uncertainty. That's good. There are new problems to solve. And that is consistent with ideas about not a linear progress of science. It's not that you know more, there is less uncertainty or less things to know. No, there are more things to know. Because we are modified to the point that we have other type of problems, new problems. But there is a negative aspect of it, or what Michael's called the pathological aspects, that if you are in a, situ in, a, in a political policy situation, regulatory situation, you can hire a consultant mm -hmm. that will create uncertainty. Okay? That will create uncertainty. Is that clear? A, a, recently, there's another book by, a, I think it was Nomi Oreskes, and it was called Doubt is There. Merchants of Doubt, I think, in relation to climate. Think, the Michaels concentrate, I think, if I remember correctly, on the tobacco and pharma industry. Okay. So you can create uncertainty in order to act strategically. So what you have is a beginning of a politicization of uncertainty, okay, Ar around the 90s. And then this, I, I love this. <laughs> This is from nature, and it's related to what you would say a simple problem, which is air, air pollution or contamination. <laughs> and it says, the title is wonderful, Hazy Reasoning Behind Clean Air. What clean air? And so what you do, according to what I explained before, you call a group of experts that have to come with a with a quantitative assessment about, uh, you know, about the state of air, water, whatever, okay? 
come with a threshold, a standard, whatever, those response. Okay. And he said, well, they called the committee, and <laughs> the committee said that the evidence is of high uncertainty. Again, all what I said before, you are not in a typical modern science problem. And then what's interesting is the conclusion that what to do in the face of uncertainty is a policy question, not a scientific one. Because, in a sense, for science, uncertainty is natural. And every discipline, more or less, with more maturity or less maturity, has created their techniques or procedures to deal with uncertainty. It's precisely in the interface between science and policy where uncertainty becomes relevant. Especially in a context where it is politicized. Relate that to, <laughs> to Ruckel's house in the 70s, 20 years, or even 30 years before, eh? saying precisely that the problems he had to face as administrating uh, the Environmental Protection Agency of were of trans-scientific character. You see how it all relates precisely. The other important, and, and this is, as you see, I go back in time to 19, the 1950s. And it is precisely about the relation between facts, values, probabilities, and statistics. So the idea that a scientist working as a scientist make value judge. I won't go into detail, but you can go. That's a, a, a classical article in the philosophy of science. And you see what is strong, and it has to do with evidence, with tests of hypotheses, and all the things that we, ha we can really develop. But I'm not going to do that now. Now, when I talk about this relation, problem-solving strategy about reducing political practical problems to, to techno-scientific ones. Here you see the whole thing about San Palmisano was the head chairman of IBM. And as you know, IBM invented the idea of smart, the idea of smart work. And when we talked about conflicts and crises between science and democracy, let me use that as a shortcut, labels. This precisely. This is what Misano says. It's, as it's not ideological, it's just technical, there's no point in even debating it. So what you have is that the space of democratic deliberation is being occupied by techno-scientific solutions that are non-ideological. And the result today is the whole discussions of the biased character of algorithms and machine learning. You know, uh, algorithms are used more and more in, in the courts for policing and profiling. Okay? And there is a vast literature today about the biased character. In two senses, or even extended. One is because of the people who are doing it. And two, because of the data they are collecting. And in a sense, the third, because they are not transparent. And nobody really knows what the hell the algorithm is doing. Okay.
Okay. So, uh, now we can revisit this idea. I think, uh, and we can do it in a bit more problematizing situation. You can interpret the, the mantra in a kind of ironic way. Because facts are uncertain. Facts cannot be uncertain. OK? So what we are saying is just something quite ironic about the received view about facts. But it challenges the original separation duality facts values. Second, values in dispute. But values, nothing to do with science. They are, as I say, externalities to science. Then we talk value neutral, objectives, etc. Stakes high, the same. Nothing to do with science stakes. And you can ask yourself, stake, stakes for whom? Thanks for whom? Clearly, stakes are different for different types of people. And the last one is decision urgent. Are really decision urgent? So, in a sense, you can take it as face value, as the mantra, characterizing the post-normal situation, problem-solving situation. Or you can then use them as an entry point to problematize the, the situation and the whole narrative of modernity. Then the diagram. The diagram, again, is it's just a heuristic diagram. You know, this diagram has created a cottage industry. There are so many papers modifying and changing and trying to quantify and all the rest. Of that. It's OK. I mean, I have nothing bad to say about that. But we never thought about those in those terms. It's just heuristic. It helps you to think about it. And the fact is that you, when you move from the applied science to the what we call professional to the post-normal science, what you have is that it opens a space in relation to who judges quality, who decides what quality is, and at the same time, how this is institutionalized. Just to give you a simple example to think about past, before going into the post-normal, the distinction between applied science and professional consultancy has been institutionalized in what we call a social contract. If you, are, if you are a biologist, a physicist, you have a certain type of social contract. But if you are a doctor or an architect or an engineer, your social contract with society is very different. OK? This is historically. And why do you think it is that? It's because of the, what we call the uncertainty or indeterminacy of the situation, and also what is at stake. It opens. It's not only the professionals of that discipline that decide on that. Histori and that goes even well beyond our imagination. The code of Hammurabi decides what's the situation when with an engineer. What happens if an engineer builds a bridge or a house and the house collapses? Or the bridge collapses? The quote of Hammurabi said the engineer pays with his life. It 
You can complain about that, but uh, sometimes I think the, the, the engineer was asked to, to sleep inside or under the bridge, whatever. But, you know, in my forward. But anyway, the fact is that there was a, there is has to do with the choices that you can make as an architect, as a doctor. This is why you have a th second opinion in medicine, no? And so, do you understand? So you extend, because precisely stakes and uncertainties involved, uh, I, we call, I don't want to go into the technical details about uncertainty. No. Okay, so this is how you explain. And these ideas about extension, what we call extended peer communities to judge quality. And with this I will fit with two examples. The first I mentioned to some of you, the original idea of Archie Cochrane, and then developed into the Cochrane collaboration. Those working with health will remember that. The idea is the origin of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based policy. I won't go into the, I mean, it's a, a whole chapter that we can, with, uh, with Anibal, develop late, or if it's interesting. Yeah. But substantially, originally, was the idea that all the users participate in the evaluation of quality of, uh, uh, of procedures and, and, and products, meaning family of the person, nurses, and others. And that was constituted. So what you have is opening. It was not only medical doctors who evaluated, or uh, the, those the researchers. There was a wider community that for them was important, relevant, that had a stake in the issue that contributed to frame the problem of quality and uh, establish the evidence for that. Okay? So uh, that's precisely one of the origins of that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, popular epidemiology, it was another one. And then, and with this I will finish, there is a whole tradition of what is called total quality control. And that was originated by a person called Edwards Deming, an American, who had these ideas about quality control, so he went to Detroit to tell them what we thought about quality in the production of cars, and he, they say, forget it. They didn't want to know. So he was sent to Japan by the military, uh, the, the American occupation forces, and he happened to go and talk to a Toyota. It's true. And they told them the story about how he believes about quality and all that. And they say, this is exactly what we want. Because culturally, they were in tune with his idea about total quality control. I'm not trying to romanticize the story, but just tell you something. So he went to Toyota, and, and this is how the idea of a quality of Japanese industry starts with an American who was rejected by, by Detroit, who did it in Japan. And what was one of the key elements? There's a lot, but one of the key elements, it was called the quality circles. So it was not a person or a technician, but it was the community of those working, working, working on the production assembly line, who decided on quality. And they were, if you, you can go and search, and you will see all these posters about a worker say, saying, there is a problem. And the whole thing stopped. And the whole quality circle discussed the problem. Without being afraid of being sucked, which was what was happening in the trial. So this idea, so these are the two elements that we had in mind at that time when we were thinking about the extended peer communities and the notion of quality. And this is why we consider quality, in this case, more important, I being very careful with truth. In the case of science for policy, we are not searching for truth. 
I mean, I am very careful about this because that takes you into heavy epistemology, theontology, metaphysics. I, I don't want to go into that. And uh, it's for another time. Uh, but, uh, and I'm not against people searching for truth, okay? I want to clarify that. But what is interesting is not the relation between what we say or we do and something that's external. Quality is a relation with is fitness for purpose or for function. And the question we ask ourselves, who decides what's the function or the purpose? It's a community. You see? That's the difference. So the question that if you, if you look at the clean air is, is a problem of how good even if uncertain, is an input to a policy process. It's the process itself that defines how, what type of uncertainty one, it can tolerate. Right? Of course, that then developed into in city science, citizen science, another type of initiative of the type, that, si that citizens became co-creators, co co-producers of knowledge, and etc. Okay, so you see, started with <laughs> the mantra and, and the diagram, and then you have a programmatic aspect, which is the quality. In a sense, the problem starts with the community. The problem has to frame community. The crit criteria for function and quality has to be done by a community. And therefore, science appears as one of the elements that contribute to a resolution. And I'm being careful here. I say resolution, not solution. The problem might not have a solution as it is proposed. But during the process, it changes and evolves. And that's a resolution problem. Is that clear? The way... Uh, 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 now, uh, yes, I talked a bit more. Yeah, we have 20 minutes until lunch. And I don't know how it is uh, we can uh, discuss or uh, talk about, I don't know from a technical point of view, but I can give uh, the... I think you need the microphone. I can, yeah. Uh, but uh, if someone, you have questions. Uh, I have a question. Do you know that I have a question? Well, do you, why don't you, sorry. Why don't you introduce yourself because of the streaming? So give your name. Okay, I'm Paola Zaratin and I'm Director of Scientific Research at the Italian MS Society and Coordinator of uh, Multi-Act H2020 Responsible Research Innovation Process. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation, very inspiring. And uh, I have first a, a, a question regarding the, uh, the modality you have in your chart, in your mantra. So can you give us an example on uh, applied science and professional consultancy uh, versus post-normal science uh, in taking decision? Uh, because this would help uh, you know, to recognize these different steps in uh, what we are doing in uh, each sector, from health to economy, whatever. Uh, so this is the first question. And the second question is, uh, uh, do you think that uh, we may have to develop a new discipline so that uh, maybe we cannot name a science also for post-normal science, and in this case, uh, what can be the direction? Okay. Uh, yes, I, I, I will answer each of you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first uh, uh, problem. You see, one of the amazing things, uh, for me at least, is how well the reduction idea of Galileo, how well it worked. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, how successful it was. So, the idea of uh, about reducing complexity in a certain way, at a certain moment of time, it was incredibly successful. Because, of course, you can think about those things in a more complex way, and then uh, uh, perhaps you wouldn't <laughs> go uh, as fast as science went at that time. You know, and everybody knows all the discussions, no, uh, between Galileo and uh, Cardinal Cardinal Bellarmino about the reality of what he was watching through the telescope and all the rest. But the simplification he did with this modeling idea, the idea of a linear, eh, linear. Eh, process that you can compose. So if you had a complicated problem, you reduce it to simple components, and then you added them, which is the basis, as I say, of modeling and the experimental. That worked. You see? That worked. And at the same time, this simplification about so the idea of institutions created around that fact-finding and a expression quantitative you know, developed the scientific disciplines, the universities and knowledge that was very important for the development of the national sovereign states. You know, because that enabled, for example, commerce, navigation. And then you see small, very small European countries becoming world powers. Portugal, the Netherlands. This was a, a transformation. So what I'm saying is that it's not the nature of the problem that it is applied science professional, but the way we imagine it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't mention it, but it was an important book for us in the... 60s, 70s, I think, I can remember, it was by Robert Piercyk. It was called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. People of a certain age will know it. And, and as you know, the, the person that were the, the, the main person, character in the book is someone who used to write technical reports for appliances. Those things you never understand because they are whatever translation. Never understand. He used to write them, so he used to think, and in relation to the engine of a motorcycle, that you can look at it as a simple thing, or you can th think about it in a complex relationship with the engine. For us, it was very. Inspired. It depends because it's not that the things out there are complex or simple. They are, if they are which is another question. They are. It's us who decide if you look at them in a simple way, in a complicated way, or in a complex way. That distinction was done by Poincaré in, uh, in 1900. And it was related to a problem in physics, which is the three-body problem, which is a complicated problem. But he said there are other things that are complex. So, uh, I will, I will say, uh, for example, when you are in professional consultancy, you go to architect, stupid example, you want to do a, you want to build a house for you. I mean, there's not a unique design that the architect, and if you don't like it, you go to another architect, because it all depends on how much money you have, on your taste, and all the rest. So that would be a typical, it's not decided but some natural laws. So that's, and in, in simple applied science, you have things that actually work and continue to work. You, do, you don't want to go into heavy relativistic or quantum to solve some problems on the earth. You see? So 
That's precisely the point. And what I try to, t uh, that relates to the second. What I try to say is, one, we no longer believe for some reasons that the problems are simple, simply because at the same time that we develop the science and technology, we develop societies uh, and our civilization. If you think about it, I, I believe that at the beginning of 1950, most of the population of Europe was illiterate. I don't know the numbers exactly, but it was. And today, everybody has a smartphone and all, all the rest. And that happened in 50, 60 years. So we accept now diversity, different lifestyles, a lot of things. Clearly, what well, for some people are simple problems, for others are complex. Is that? Now, to finish, so we can have time for others, is the following. Do we need another discipline? No. And this is uh, why I always am very careful. I never talked about multidisciplinary. This is a, a whole industry. Interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, all this type of thing. I always say, and this is why Weinberg's idea of trans is important. So it's transdisciplinary. It's beyond discipline. And it relates to a conception of knowledge that goes beyond the disciplines that were created uh, with modern science. And in another sense, it cannot be like that. Because, you know, I think the word discipline in science comes from the military. It was taken from the idea of discipline in, 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 in Breda, where they have the Dutch the academy, military academy. That's the origin of discipline, I believe. If Tulmin is correct, this is how it was created. So we don't have a need a new discipline. We need a different conception of useful, relevant knowledge. And I have to say that we have moved enough on that. I mean, nobody today will say that farmers or fishermen or people, they don't have knowledge. And knowledge that it is relevant for determining policy. You see? There is knowledge coming from living experience, for knowing how. Now, how this will develop into something that, well, we don't know. But clearly we can see the germs or the, the beginning, the, the seal. No, I wanted to say the seeds, not the germs, the seeds. The seeds of that that's happening. We don't know which one will be the one that will survive and evolve. As we didn't know in the 1400s or the 1500. What we knew then was that uh, knowledge was moving from the monasteries to the universities, that life was moving from the countryside to the cities. We knew that land ownership was replaced by commerce, that land as a currency was replaced by money. We know that. You know, there's a whole today about the name of the rose, Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco, in the name of the rose, talks precisely about this transition. And for many people, they thought that the world was coming to an end. Exactly like today. But there's a world that was emerging. And that's what I believe it's happened. How it will develop, I have no idea. Question. Introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Carlos Larinaga from uh, University of Burgos. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I, and very, I'm uh, curious about uh, the role um, most of many of us are social scientists and uh, I'm, I'm curious about uh, your views about the relationship between uh, social science and natural I mean and, and science 
in 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 relation to you know uh, current problems like, for example, you have mentioned sustainability, sustainable development, etc. So I would like to 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 have your views. Thank you. Okay, uh, that takes me back to one of the original ideas I had. We had um, developing post-normal science. Uh, uh, you know, there was this idea about natural scientists dealing with hard facts and social science with soft facts. You know, uh, that was a, the masculine and the feminine. You know, you know uh, and social scientists dealt with uh, with soft facts. So what we say in, in, in our paper, I probably it is in the 93 papers, but be even before, that today, talking about then, there was an inversion. And we had soft facts, and we had to deal with hard values. Uh, so, uh, as part of the, uh, the relation, you know, uh, many years ago, and Bruna and others who worked on that, when they started to introduce social scientists into uh, what we call the business of risk assess, the, the social, what was the function of the social scientist? Was to provide numbers for the social parameters in the models that engineers develop. It's a simplification, but that was it. They say, oh, in the project, we call a, a sociologist, they were, and then we give them the parameter, and you give me the number. Use a survey, use a whatever, you know, and get me quantitative data for that. And I think perhaps you have experience of that happening also today. But then, things, uh, at least when we were dealing with risks, it, from an intellectual point of view and from a methodological, changed. Because the technical systems were no longer technical systems, were socio-technical systems. Uh, and a good friend of mine, who unfortunately died, wrote a book called Man-Made Disasters. And he, he was an engineer and a sociologist. And he said, if you want to understand an accident, a disaster, don't look only at the hard components. Look at the socio-technical whole. Because many of those can only be explained in terms of the socio-technical system. And, and then it was 84 Perot book. Uh, Perot, 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 Perot. Do you know a Perot book? He had, uh, normal accidents? Okay. That was fundamental. What's his name, Bruno? Perot, but uh, then Charles Perot, sociologist. He was a sociology of organizations. He still is, I don't know, he's still alive, he died. Yes, he's still alive. Uh, he published a book called Normal Accidents in the 80s, 84 or something, I can't remember. He, it was, he said he, the systems were complex technological systems that were tightly coupled. And then he says accidents are normal. And then he has a, a book where he actually anticipates almost perfectly the Fukushima accident, looking at the social technical whole system. You see, so what I'm saying is that the role of the social scientist is changing. Sometimes it doesn't change too fast. And sometimes many, I suppose, I don't want to be controversial here, but uh, perhaps many social scientists have physics envy in the sense that they believe in the need to quantify and therefore they are happily part 
of the process of simplification. But you have, uh, you know, and that has changed also because at that time when we were working, there were a group of anthropologists, for example, working on risks. Uh, Mary Douglas, for example, book Risk and Culture. Eh? Eh. So they were conceiving risk. Yeah. They were conceiving risk as a, a cultural phenomenon. For the good and for the bad, but that's how it worked. Okay. Uh, very soon. Yeah. Okay. My name is Bruno De Marchi, and uh, uh, it's been Silvio's partner. Uh, that you all know, I am also a social scientist, so I just wanted to add something to that. First of all, the of the role attributed to social science, which was not only providing numbers, but it also convincing. So actually, in my, in my work experience over the years, was, you know, how is it that people don't understand that, for example, this is such a low risk? So how do we convince them? And this is still there. I think very often, it's kind of a, you know, the chair, and the European uh, Commission has contributed to uh, broaden the space for social scientists also in this kind of project, but very often it's just the cherry on the K. At the end, let's have some, you know, sociological flavor. So I think there has been changes, but very often the idea is that, okay, let's have something social science instead of really having the social scientists together with the, with the natural scientists. Uh, the other thing that I want to add, um, well, it's this idea, which you illustrated uh, by uh, Barry Turner and also Charles Perrault, it's very important because their idea is really that there is a system. Very often when you read the analysis of an accident, they say, oh, it's a human factor. It's not the human factor as separated from the, 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 so it's the complexity of the human machine, so to say, interaction, which, which they made very clear. So that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, yes, uh, of course, as you know, uh, being most of you economists, is that the economists always had a privileged role into that. But to enter on why, it will open a new chapter uh, in, into that. There are a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of work on that now, no? Uh, Philip Mirovsky, for example, and uh, people like that, that worked a lot about how economists came to have such an important fu uh, uh, function in decision maker in a neoliberal economy framework. Okay? Right. Someone else? If not, oh yes, it's 31. Uh, well, I'm be here and we can continue this this afternoon so thank you very much it was a pleasure